There are more than 3,000 working satellites in orbit around Earth today, but that's a tiny number compared to the 27,000 pieces of high-velocity space junk tracked by the U.S. Department of Defense. And that's just the junk we can see. Countless other pieces of small but deadly space debris are hurtling around in orbit, threatening not only digital infrastructure like GPS and cellular communication, but also the lives of anyone who blasts off into outer space. I'm really thrilled today to be talking to Moriba Ja. He is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin, and also a leading expert on space debris and an astrodynamicist. Uh, thank you, Moriba, for talking to us. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here with you. Well, this is one of uh, the most interesting topics to me, like both because it is so important, but also because it's this kind of interesting intersection between space exploration, which is very aspirational, and then just something very human. We leave trash everywhere. So if we're going to space, we're leaving trash there. So I wanted to just start by asking, you know, what is this space junk? What, what, what is it mostly made out of and how much of there is it in space right now? Yeah, I think um, it's good to put things in context a little bit and just realize, look, in 1957, that's when we launched Sputnik. One satellite, it didn't last up there that long. And now we're kind of tracking over 26,000 objects that humans are responsible for in one way or another, you know, ranging in size from cell phone to the space station. And these things are made up of shards of things. I mean, satellites age, they get old. I call it satellite gerontology. Um, you know, the glue doesn't last forever. Body parts of the satellite start falling apart at some point. So part of it is just satellites breaking up just due to old age. But every once in a while, uh, these rocket bodies kind of explode and become many, many more pieces. So I call those super spreader events on orbit. So there's kind of a graveyard of the actual satellite components and satellites themselves. And then um, it sounds like a lot of micro meteorites as well. Is there is there any number that-, uh, that Yeah, so, so here, yeah, I mean, here's the thing, right? It's like, um, you know, NASA has an orbital debris program office at Johnson Space Center in Houston, and they hypothesize a number of things going down to this millimeter size, maybe roughly, you know, half a million or so. Mm. The European Space Agency, they have their own space debris office at the European Space Opera Operations Center in uh, Darmstadt, Germany. Their number is like, I don't know, a million. Take a look at that. Wow. So that's a, sna that's a current snapshot. That really puts it into perspective. Yeah, so so this is this is what we developed at UT, crowdsourced, um, you know, Department of Defense, Russia, some owner operators, Leo Lab with some of their data. So we just bring all this stuff together in a common framework. And so you can kind of see, um, you know, like this string of pearls right here are uh, one of the Starlink satellite uh, launches that happen. And you can like click on any one of those dots and you'll see something pop up that kind of gives you some more information about that object and that sort of thing. So yeah, this is one of the things that people can can kind of access right now, um, just so they can get an idea of the space traffic map. And one of the things that I want to do with this is I want to make this into something like Waze, just like Waze traffic app is make a Waze for space that uses this sort of thing so that the users are also people that contribute information to it, you know? Do these pieces of debris have lifespans or they do most of them deorbit or one or are they up there they once they're up there they're just up there and when satellites are in low earth orbit they tend to get bombarded by these particles and uh neutral density in the thermosphere starts slowing these things down similarly to like when you're in your car and you stick your hand out the window you can, can feel the friction it's not quite that intense but enough to where things get naturally cleansed and it's a reason why uh Elon decided to go with a lower altitude for the Starlink satellites because basically when these things stop working, Mother Nature will clean these out, you know, in you know several years and that sort of stuff. If you go higher, uh, you know, 1,200 kilometer altitude and something fails, that would, that's going to be up there for decades, if not centuries, and, and, and above that pretty much forever. Yeah. And um, how often do, they, do these pieces collide with each other? Yeah, so when it comes to actual collisions, we haven't recorded a lot of them. 
and I guess I think that lends itself to people saying, "Oh, this isn't really a problem because、mm-hmm. these collisions are infrequent." But the traffic patterns are getting more congested. Like we see that the warnings for collisions have basically gone up because of increased traffic. So, so we know that the risk has actually changed and not gotten better because there are no traffic rules in space. So we know that.、Um, but yeah, the last big kind of collision、uh, that happened. Um, was was in 2009 between、uh, a working satellite Iridium and a dead satellite from Russia, Cosmos, and these things collided and created, you know, lots and lots and lots of of debris as a consequence. Well, I have to bring up the movie Gravity at this point, right? Because that that really signal boosted this issue of this Kessler syndrome idea that there would be that cascading kind of、uh, problem of space debris colliding with more space debris, creating just a huge. Amount of cloud of dangerous、um, uh, dangerous stuff, junk. As someone who's like an expert in this field, I'd love to know your opinion on how it portrayed that kind of issue, and if that's how it would actually go down, or if that's just pure.、Hollywood. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. So,、um, look, the, gravity was was great because it actually raised some awareness, and people like, oh wow, I didn't know that this could be a thing.、Um, I think George Clooney and Sandra Bullock did their roles uh, uh, as need be in, in the storytelling, but yes, this would not happen、uh, in that fashion, and, and you wouldn't really be able to see this stuff coming at you. I mean, it's it's、mm. it's going like 15 times the speed of a bullet. It's like at the at, at the point that you'd see it, it be hitting you, kind of thing. So so there's no way that you would like see this coming. If we could, in our zeal to be exploring space and utilizing space. We could actually limit ourselves in the future and stop ourselves from being able to use it because it's just too clustered and too much debris. Is that a, a actual possible future? Yeah. So that's exactly what I'm saying with the carrying capacity. Is that we could get to the point where some of these highways, their capacity is saturated. There may be some that whose capacity is already saturated, and、mm. so、um, you know, at that point. We're just going to start suffering lots of losses of things that we care about that are providing services and capabilities, and we won't be able to use it as we're using it anymore. And so I think that that's a real threat or hazard,、um, um, kind of a tragedy of the commons. It's like you know textbook definition of tragedy of the commons. You know we have this thing called the ITU, and 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 basically it's an international organization, kind of under the UN umbrella, I think, where、um, if you want to launch something in space and it's, and it's going to transmit radio si- signals. You have to go to the ITU to get your frequency band allocated to you. I would like to see、uh, an international organization that would allocate orbital capacity to people that want to launch. Because once you've quantified that environmental impact, then it's like, oh, you want to put a thousand satellites at this altitude? Turns out that the capacity is saturated with ten. So, 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 no, you can't do that, right?、Um, you have to choose something else, or. If we say, "Hey, this orbital highway, the the, the capacity has been saturated," what are the top 100 objects that are taking up that capacity? Oh, there's so many from the U.S., so so many from Russia, China, whatever. Then you can go to those countries and say, "Hey, you've got a bunch of junk that isn't serving any purpose, and it's taking up capacity." And other countries, they have a right to use that space if they want. So, clean it up or get penalized somehow, right? Yeah, and you know, with these international projects, like things like the International Space Station, and and more and more, you know,、uh, China's new space station, lots of different countries are participating in both robotic and and human、uh, space flights. So, I'm wondering if you could just、um, walk over some of the risks of collisions or impacts or space debris.、Uh, first, to astronauts、um, as we continue to try to push humans, the human species, out into space, but also just. The kind of infrastructure that's out there that we use every day, like you know, how how could、uh, this escalating problem, if it doesn't get contained properly, affect us? Yeah, absolutely. So look, starting with with humans,、um, I see a real, I see a real、uh, risk to the loss of human life as a consequence of debris. Like that hasn't happened yet, but、um, I do have friends that are astronauts, and they all have stories about. Hearing dings on the outer hull of, like, you know, space station because of pieces of debris, or having to be evacuated, or seeing something go by that they didn't get any warning. It's like, oh, something went by, right? That could have smacked against the station. So,、mm-hmm. it's, I think it's just a matter of time,、um, you know, before one of these astronauts is doing one of these、uh, extra vehicular activities, a spacewalk kind of stuff, and it 
penetrates the suit and it's like game over. Um, so I think that that's a real risk. And, and um, you know, certainly when it comes to services and capabilities we depend upon, like position, navigation, timing, banking, even climate change monitoring and that sort of stuff, we don't have uh, we don't have these satellites necessarily sitting on a shelf or on a rocket ready to launch so that when we lose something, we just like launch another one. It takes time, it takes resources. And so real capabilities that we depend upon on a daily basis could basically disappear as a result of things that we don't care about colliding into the things that we do care about. That's a very sobering thought, and um, yeah, absolutely. I can't, you know, it's it's bad enough to be on a boat at sea and and have like a log hit your boat. I can't even imagine being on the space station having things zipping by like that um, to be so exposed that way. Well, that, that kind of brings me to the idea of like the space removal uh, techniques that might be in development for this. You mentioned like making people responsible for clearing their orbital lane the way that we do on Earth with traffic. Um, so I've seen so many cool ideas about this, like robotic arms, the nets, the magnets, um, all these different ways to try to get trash out of space. Uh, do, you th do you see those kind of maturing on the horizon and, and which kinds of techniques are most practical to you? Well, so one of the interesting things that I was able to participate in was uh, an activity in Australia called CERC, S-E-R-C. And um, that was all about investigating the use of ground-based lasers to kind of nudge, nudge, uh, you know, smaller pieces of debris, slow them down a little bit so that then they could like re-enter on their own. And wow. so I know that there's some people in Germany that also have some lasers looking at that. And I think, and the European Space Agency is very interested in this technology as well. So that's a real thing. Like we could actually start using lasers to deorbit some of these pieces and start, uh, you know, cleaning up some of the debris that way. But I will say this, right? It's like, just like microplastics in the ocean, mm -hmm. um, we will never have a pristine space environment. So, so I think that's one thing that everybody needs to embrace that reality is just, just like the ocean will never be rid of microplastics, um, space will never be rid of human-based uh, debris. So we can try to do some of the reme remediation work, but um, there's a level of filth that we now have to accept that we're always going to be living in. This also ties into um, something that you identify as, you call yourself a space environmentalist. And, you know, using all these biological anal analogies and things like that, I can see it's very much uh, something that you think about in those terms. And so um, what what is space environmentalism broadly? Yeah, so it's, it's really um, understanding that everything's interconnected. I'm a butterfly effect kind of guy. So it's like, um, yes, we have, things on lands, we have oceans, we have air, and I'm saying we and space. And it's like we have a we have a system of systems. It's all linked in some way. And so space environmentalism is really about environment, you know, environmental protection, environmental impact, uh, ecological sustainability that connects all these different domains and brings in space and acknowledging space as this lost ecosystem or or unacknowledged ecosystem yeah you know it's it, this it all ties into so much of the stuff that you're very interdisciplinary in the way you approach things i had i read this great quote that you were trying to make uh space studies at, at ut austin like hogwarts for space <laughs> which is perfect and um you know you have this career that you know you're very well known now of course as as a leading expert on on space debris and have done so much work on that but you've also done work uh, with NASA, um, doing uh, orbit determination for Mars missions, and you've worked in the private sector and at these different research institutions. So I think that really uh, obviously does uh, inform this very broad view that you have a lot of these different trends. And I'm just wondering with that in mind, um, what are some of the other big trends that you're seeing right now in space and the, the public sphere and the private sphere? that you think are gonna be really uh, substantial in terms of their changes to our daily lives in the coming decades. So I wanna normalize space, meaning right now I, I, I feel that there's too much, when it comes to space, there's too much idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, 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 there are the groupies and the, oh, you know, you know you've know you gone to space and, and please sign this and, 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 and you know, you're my hero. And it's like, look, I think it's great to see astronauts um, be able to be such positive and strong influences to folks. And 
I have good friends and best friends that are astronauts. And at the same time, it's like, we don't worship airline pilots. We don't worship people that navigate boats. So the thing is, it's like, it's, it's humanity's own limitation. It's like humans won't be able to participate openly in space if there's this gap in the mind of humans that this is something that you should worship and it's for other people or you need to be you need, you need to have three phds or you need to have a billion dollars or that that's not going to work for us to get off the planet and become a multi-planet species which i think is critical like there's no way that our story on earth um is it go, goes infinitely long we have an expiration date on this planet whether it's because of taking up resources here or eventually some asteroid smacks us like it did before right so the thing is we need to find a way to thrive elsewhere in the universe and we don't get there through idolatry